And all those are much more dangerous things. I think those are the reasons that people miss a lot of questions in cars because- Phil back with another MCAT podcast. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So we have some uh, exciting-ish news for the MCAT podcast, like has happened two times previously here on the podcast. We are losing a co-host. Uh, Phil is leaving Blueprint Prep and will no longer be a co-host here on the MCAT podcast. And uh, that is the news. Yeah, you might be hearing from me at uh, different points in the future, <laughs> but yeah, it's been a, a long a long trail been with blueprints since before they were blueprint back when they were next step. Um, but yeah, you know, some opportunities came up and I'm honestly, I'm going to miss the podcast. Um, uh, so as you should, I might, might have to swing, swing back by every once in a while. <laughs> do it do a little cameo appearance, appearance right right yeah it's like when you drive by the house you grew up in as a kid and you're like hey like i used to live there like can i check it out and they're like no what are you doing here weirdo get out of here yeah. i feel like that's what you're gonna be like if i come back you're like who is this strange man <laughs> go away get off my lawn um all right well it is what it is we wish you success in whatever you are going to next and uh we'll see what the mcat brings us in the future the mcat podcast brings us in the future yeah i have to admit i'm a little sad that i didn't make it through the entire exam um here on the podcast uh, this exam that we've been working through but we are finishing on one of my favorite passages <laughs> of all time so but um, on honestly phil it, it basically makes you like almost every other student where you just couldn't finish the MCAT. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Right. I got fatigued partway through. I'm out tapping out. I'm, I'm going to go be a DAT podcaster now after this. <laughs> Ouch. That stings. <laughs> My brother wanted to be a dentist. I would always make that joke. Around. He would get so mad. That's funny. Um, awesome. All right. So let's go ahead and jump in. We're continuing our breakdown of Blueprint MCAT's full length one, which you can get for free at blueprintprep.com slash MCAT. The full length one and half length diagnostic are both free when you sign up for all of their goodies. Uh, and if you want to follow along in a more of a visual way, premed.tv will have this video up as well. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump into passage seven. Yeah. So I think a big takeaway that we had last week was to remember not to bring in outside knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very interesting passage about small businesses and shysters trying to like steal your money. Um, but here we have um, a new passage. This one, now some students are going to have some outside info. Some are not because this passage is actually based around video games. Mm -hmm. And so you got to be really careful if you're a video game player, not to bring in outside knowledge because you probably have some knowledge and opinions on these. I recognize that there are some of you out there that like, I don't play video games. Uh, <laughs> I want to play Among Us. I really want to start like, I want to stream it and do like <laughs> pre-med Q&A while we're playing Among Us. Yeah, well, let's let's do that. I'm, I'm in. I'm in. We'll do it. <laughs> um, all right. So, so beware of bringing in that outside knowledge. Kind of going back to last week where we talked about being a reporter and not an analyst. Yeah, exactly. Right. So the most obvious question concerning video games of interest to philosophers and estheticians is whether video games belong to the category of artworks. Three philosophers have offered arguments in favor of video games as artworks, but showing that video games possess the qualities sufficient to be admitted as artworks under any given theory of art does not quite show the video games as a medium are aesthetically interesting. And so kind of an interesting thing here, like is a video game a piece of art? There's some like there's some contrast here in this like last sentence, right? Like there are people who've argued that it like it fits under the the guise of artwork, but yep. like the authors bringing their own kind of like question here at the end of like, okay, like yeah, uh, the definition of art maybe applies, but are these interesting? Are these aesthetically interesting? Yep. Um, and so kind of like a different question that I'm trying to figure out like what the answer is to this, because the author's probably going to have a viewpoint, right? I can see this, you know, coming down the line. Yep. So video games are an artistically valuable medium. Well, that didn't take long, right? <laughs> like that was, well, they are. Um, games are artworks precisely do. The author here is taking some very strong arguments. Games are art, yep. right? Awesome. Games are artworks precisely due to their qualities. Video games are an appreciative art kind, a class of artworks that share a common feature and should be appreciated as artworks, 
in part by virtue of possessing that feature. So there's some feature that's similar to video games. This feature, which I name representation by regulated interaction, will offer both philosophers and ludologists evidence to claim both that video games may be artworks and that the medium has something new and interesting to offer the world of art. I think there were a lot of students that like said, well, you know, when they heard we were talking about video games, like, oh, this is going to be so easy and fun. But then we we're talking about like ludologists and like appreciative art kinds and, <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> um, but like the takeaway here is like there's some feature that makes video games art. And this feature is representation by regulated interaction. What is this? I got no idea. Right. Like they're they're probably going to have to give me some explanation here. But there's some feature that all video games have that's unique and separates it from the world of art. So I want to make sure that I, I understand what this term is going forward, because this is what separates video games from everything else. Right. We're always looking for that contrast and opinion stuff. Um, we already have some good opinion. The author says video games are art because they have this and other things don't have. This. So we're trying to figure out what's going on. There are many ways in which the video game represents information about our player characters. One type of representation, however, contrasty, is not only revealed to the audience through interacting with the video game, but in fact consists of the way such interaction occurs. Video games can represent facts about their fictional subjects by manipulating the way the player interacts with those subjects via representation by regulated interaction. The way the avatar responds to player input represents something about the character. Now, this is something that happens very often where the MCAT will give a lot of like definitions and it's kind of confusing. And then they'll say, for instance, and they'll give you an example. And you're always like, thank you. Thank <laughs> you for giving me an example. So, so yeah. because it's so confusing. Yep. For instance, it's common for the relative mass of a character to be represented to the player by having the avatar move slowly or quickly in response to movement commands. Characterizing these techniques as representational capacities enables the artistic potential of these techniques to be better understood. So just, are you, when when you're picking your your character for Mario Kart, it tells you how fast they are, right, or right. how they're how many, steering. How many exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. But this idea here is that like it's not necessarily like what's happening on screen, but it's how you're you're controlling them. And so if somebody is heavier, they're gonna like respond slower when you're trying to like move them around. If they're lighter, they're gonna move faster. And the author is arguing that this communicates some information to you. And so you are understanding something about the video game that isn't being shown on screen. It's the way that you're controlling the characters themselves that are providing information. This is about as uh, like philosophical and heady as a passage about video games can be, right? Um, kind of an interesting one. So some have suggested that some forms of theater or interactive installation may make use of representation by regulated interaction. The key difference is that all the interactive works use interactivity to engage their audience, but only video games are capable of using interactivity to represent something about their subjects. So those two sentences are really interesting, right? That some have suggested. So there are some people who don't think this makes video games special, right? The author disagrees, right? The key difference is they help you engage the audience, but only video games are capable of using interactivity to represent things about their subjects. Mm. Video games have the unique ability to place the player in direct control of a subject of the work, the avatar. Because we take on a character role, we can be represented to about that character through the way they act on our instructions in the world of the video game. Only in video games will the audience be able to rep be represented to about their character as that character and not as an external viewpoint with supernatural access to the character's mental states, as in first-person literature, or viewing a scene as if through their eyes, as in film or other visual arts. So there's a lot of like very like detail-driven stuff here, but I think the important thing is this like second sentence that says the key difference is that like video games are the only ones that do this, right? And so they're they're talking about other stuff that some other things do, but only in video games are you communicated to about the the actual avatar itself how cool would it be if like you you go to the the louvre and there there's like a vr game in front of mona lisa and now all of a sudden you are mona lisa walking around in her world right yeah i'm <laughs> i'm totally on board right um so avatars are not always anthropomorphic characters so it could be a painting right <laughs> yeah 
the recent from dust places the player uh, places the player in the role of the breath of a god sculpting the world to satisfy or frustrate the needs of its occupants. <laughs> Flower finds the player acting on the world of the video game through the fictional proxy of a breeze. Anything that can play the role of the avatar in a video game has the potential to utilize regulated interaction, and this broadens the distinctive artistic scope of game art. In no other medium would it be possible to enable the audience to feel some of what it is like to act on the world as a breeze, a deity, or any of the avatars that video games might use. Thus, representation by regulated interaction can be used to great artistic effect. The artistic capabilities of representation by regulated interaction are limited only by the objects that can be represented as avatars and the relationship that can be developed between them and their players. So, super deep passage about a topic that a lot of people are pretty <laughs> comfortable with. Right? Like, so it's this, like, Whoa, weird man, myth. that's not how I think about my video games. <laughs> right, right. Like, I, like, I, a part of me wants to play these games. Now. Like, I want to be a breeze, right? Like, I don't want, I want to know what it's like to be a breeze. Um, and that's something that evidently is unique specifically to, um, to video games. Yeah. Whew. All righty, let's go yeah, ahead and dive it's, it's in here. Yeah, it's a deep one. First question I'll let you tackle. Yeah, so what is the main purpose of the fourth paragraph, beginning with some have suggested? A, to claim that video games only use avatars to represent information about the character to the player. B, to explain how video game avatars are different from first-person narrative films and other visual arts. C, to pers persuade the reader that other forms of interactive artwork are just as capable of using representation by regulated interaction. Or D, to counter the argument that other art forms may be able to make use of representation by regulated interaction. Who the main purpose. So. Yeah, so they're not asking you exactly what was said. They're asking you, like, why did the author say this? Yeah. Right. And that's that's a different question. And I think that so many students like don't realize what the question is. They get too caught up in the answers and the passage. Yeah. But the question is asking, like, no, why did we say this? Yeah. So this is interesting. So the the author here is saying some have suggested that other forms of theater and interactive installation may make use of this representation by regulated interaction. So we have this thought in our head that it's not just video games. But the key difference, so it's almost like the, the author here is arguing against that thought. So the author here, right, the main purpose of this is the author claiming that video games potentially are the only ones or that there is a difference. So let me, let me look at it from that angle. Uh, to claim that video games use only avatars to represent information about the characters to the player. Um... I don't know if that's true. B, to explain how video game avatars are different from first-person narratives, films, and other visual arts, uh, I think is potentially where that's getting to, right? The key difference, different, mm -hmm. uh, potentially. To persuade the reader that other forms of interactive artwork are just as capable. No, I'm not going to go with that one, because that would be arguing for... To counter the argument that other art forms may be able to use... Oh, okay, so... So D is basically what it's doing, right? Is countering mm -hmm. the argument, right? Here's the argument. Other forms of art uh, can be you can use this, but then the rest of it is countering that. So I'm gonna go with D. Yeah, very good. Um, so looking at some of the other ones, like A, like they did say that video games are the only ones that can use the avatar to represent information, but not that video games can only use the avatars to represent information. Mm -hmm. And so that's like a weird, like distortion where it's like almost right. But like, just like move the words around a little bit more. Um, I like that you were kind of like pulled in by B and D because B and D both seem true according mm. to the passage, right? Both of those are in scope. They're the author's viewpoint. C is like the opposite of the author's viewpoint. So that's wrong because that's just wrong within the scope of the passage. And so B is this weird answer that is true in the scope of the passage. Not It's not, it's not true outside knowledge, but it's true in the passage. The, the problem with that is that it doesn't answer the question, right? And so we call that like a faulty use of detail or like true but wrong, right? Like, yeah, that's something that's 
in the scope of the passage. It's it's a true statement. The author feels that way. It is different, but that's not why the author brought this up. The author brought up this stuff to say that, like, no, like, video games are the only things that can use this representation by regulated interaction. The author wasn't trying to say, like, no, video games are so different, right? Like, and so, like, making sure that you understand what the question's asking is super important to avoid those answers, which are very tempting mm. because they're actually, like, they're true. Yeah. And so that seems right. Yeah. All righty. Next question. Question 37. Based on the author's claims in the passage, the relationship between a video game and, uh, and quote, appreciative art kind whew, is one in which, A, an appreciative art kind is an example of and a subset of the category of video games. B, a video game is an example of and a subset of the category appreciative art kind. Oh, I'm lost already. C, the <laughs> definitions of the two categories are mutually exclusive in a single work, although complementary in a broader view. Or D, the category video game and the category appreciative art kind are converses. Wow. All right. So I don't even remember this appreciative art kind, right? So video games are an appreciative art kind, a class of works that share a common feature and should be appreciated in part by virtue of possessing that video, blah, blah, blah. <sighs> appreciative video game, oh, the relationship between a video game and an appreciative art kind, right? The author is saying video games are an appreciative art kind. So... An appreciative art kind is an example of and a subset of the category of video games. I don't know if it's a subset of the category of video games. Mm, I don't know about that. Uh, a video game is an example of and a subset of the category of appreciative art kind. Mm, that makes more sense. The definitions of the two subcategories, the two categories, are mutually exclusive in a single work. Although complementary, that doesn't make sense. The video, the category video game and the category uh, appreciative are kind of converse. So C and D don't make any sense. I'm going to go with B. Yeah, very good. There's that, like, this is the sort of question that, like, when I start looking at those answer choices, like, I, my, my eyes are swimming, the words are <laughs> swimming, like, it doesn't make sense. Then you go back to the past, you're like, oh, video games are an appreciative art kind, which is this class of works. And so I'm just trying to match that. Yeah. Um, that's like saying, like, Great Danes are dogs, right? And that's so a great Danes like fit within the, the category of dogs. Note that flipping that doesn't make sense, right? Like dogs are great Danes, right? Like that, that's not actually true, right? Cause there are dogs that are not great Danes. And so, um, because video games are an art kind, video games are a subset of this appreciative art kind. And so B is the answer. Um, don't try to answer this question without going back to the passage. Like always <laughs> go back to the passage. If you have a question like this. Yeah. But that's always the question, right, is is in terms of timing for the MCAT, that's always the struggle is where do I draw that line between trying to remember versus going back to the passage? Now, there are some pundits out there, if that's the right word, some MCAT pundits who will say, don't go back to the passage, never go back to the passage. I have the exact opposite view. <laughs> <laughs> and and there are people who are successful in that state where they don't have to go back to the passage yep. right i think it's a minority but there are people out there in order to like be able to do that you have to like remember very well like what was in the passage my memory is not that great i wish it was i wish i could read something and remember verbatim like word for word exactly what the passage said but i my brain doesn't work that way um Here's the thing. You don't get any points for reading the passage well, right? Like if you read the passage well, like you don't get any points for that. You get points for answering the questions. And so when you get to the questions, I always want to go back because if I rely on my memory, and this might have to do with my personal weaknesses when I first started prepping for the MCAT, my weaknesses, I was thinking too much. I was bringing in outside knowledge. And if, and if I'm not going back to the passage and I'm going inside my own head, I am way more likely to do that, mm. um, to like come up with my own things and maybe misremember the words and kind of like twist them around or like bring in outside information. And all those are much more dangerous things. I think those are the reasons that people miss a lot of questions in cars is because they're trying to go off of their memory. Yep. And so in my view, you should be spending less time on the passage and more time on the questions with the ability to go back. And like you spend less time on the passage so that you can go back. I know that doesn't always come across because 
like as I'm reading the passages, I'm I'm trying to show you like what thoughts are occurring in my my head, and like that takes time to verbalize, and so it takes a long time to like talk through the passage. Um, but in reality, I'm reading through like this is important, this is cool, rightly important, right? This is this, right? Like that thing, like the author says that it is an artistically valuable medium, right? And it's like, that's important. And I'm just kind of like going through catching things that I think are important so that I can come back to them if I need to. Um, I think you just have to be careful. Like I said, there are people out there who are successful reading the passage and then never looking back. But I think that is such a minority of people. And I think, I don't think anyone, or I don't think everyone can be successful that way i think yeah. a very subset Some of people can, can be yeah. i think everyone can be successful if they go back to the passage right and so i'm i'm trying to make the argument of what i think is useful for everyone yeah. not like what was useful just for me or just for a certain person or yeah. certain sort of person you know one of those super mind people when you talk <laughs> to them and they just like oh i just read it and like i remember it forever and I'm like oh <laughs> yeah i wish i wish that was an option i just do it right just just remember it right like yeah. there you go um, <laughs> What do you mean you had to go back? Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been I've been watching a, a new TV show lately. It's an old older show called Suits, uh, about this lawyer who has this memory where he reads it once and it's forever in his mind. Yeah. If if I had a super, or if I could get a superpower, that might be. I know that's not as flashy as like flying, invisibility, super strength, but just I just want to remember the stuff that I read. Yeah. My life would have been so much easier <laughs> if that was if that was possible. Yeah. 38. Suppose it is found that other forms of theater or interactive installations are capable of using interactivity to represent things about their subjects. How this impact the claim that video games are an appreciative art kind? Hmm. A, it would have no effect on the author's claim. B, it would disprove the author's claim. C, it would weaken the author's claim. D, it would contradict the author's claim. Oh man. So really at the heart of this is is what is the author saying is special about video games and the author talks about this representation by regulated interaction um where oh the the oh man the where is the Right, the relative mass of the character is represented by the player having the avatar move slowly. The video games can represent facts about their fictional subjects by manipulating the way players interact with those subjects. So uh, I think that's what the, this question is getting to, is if a art installation or something can do these things, then... How would that change? So are people using interactivity to represent things about their subjects? How would this impact the claim that video games are an appreciative art kind? It would have no effect on the author's claim. It would disprove the author's claim. It would weaken the author's claim. It would contradict the author's claim. To me, this is just straightforward. If if these things can do that, then great. They're the same as video games, but it doesn't change it doesn't change what the author is saying about video games. It just adds, it just adds other things about, yeah, I don't think it would have, it would, it would have no effect. Right. Like they have this argument in the passage, video games are an appreciative art kind, which is a class of works that share a common feature. Yeah. And so if something else has that feature that doesn't like video games still all share this feature. And so like, they're still an yeah. appreciative art. It's kind. like, it's like saying the sky is blue but that car is blue too. Does that right. change the, does that, the sky? Does that is weaken blue? the argument <laughs> yeah. right, about the sky? No, not really. Some something else I would mention here. So I talk about this sometimes. MCAT judo, <laughs> which is using the MCAT's weight against itself. Like in judo, use your opponent's weight against yourself. So if they're yep. bigger and stronger, that's that's fine. Like that means you they you got more weight to turn against themselves. If you're boxing and they're bigger and stronger than you, you got a problem. But in judo, it's not a problem. So. MCAT judo is using the exam against the exam. And so as I look at these answer choices here, right, we have these, these different answers, like it would disprove or weaken or contradict or have no effect on the author's claim. If it disproved the author's claim, I think that would also weaken it, right? Mm. Like, if, like I had a viewpoint, and someone disproved it. Well, my argument is weakened, mm. right? Or if it contradicted my claim, that would also weaken the author's claim. 
And so if B is true, then C is also true. Mm -hmm. And I can't have two true answers. If D is true, then C is also true. It's possible to weaken a claim without disproving it or contradicting it, maybe. And so C is still possible yeah. as an answer choice. But B and D I can eliminate off the bat. Like, I don't even have to read the passage to know it's got to be A or C, right? And that, that's a really powerful tool. As you look at the relationships of the answers to each other, like e even if you have no idea and you didn't read the passage, you're down to a 50-50, which yep. is awesome. Um, and definitely something to pay attention to. I think most students will get this, this answer, get this question. Um, but I do think it's also really useful for you to kind of like stop and, and realize, like, was there another way to come at this? Is another way to eliminate answer choices other than just like what makes sense and what doesn't? Like you can actually use the exam, like the, the way the questions worded or the different answer choices to help you like eliminate answers, which is awesome. Yeah. So kind of a follow up question to that, and this is more MCAT strategy. So the way that we go through the questions here on this podcast is we read the question, we read the answers. Do you recommend that students do that? Read the question, read the answers, or do you recommend read the question, don't be confused by the answers, think about the question, think about the answers, and then go find the answer in the answers? So I think that that's... Uh, kind of a tricky question. It kind of depends a little bit on the student. Mm. Um, I definitely have some students who are overthinkers and who will talk themselves into the wrong <laughs> answer time after time. Yep. Um, and that's, that's a real thing. I also like for those students, like trying to predict what you think the answer is so useful, right? Yep. Like that, that'll like change your score, like three or four points overnight by just like switching to doing this. Um, so I'm, I'm a big advocate. It will never hurt you to try to predict what you think the answer is. Um, first before you before you look at the answer choices like that's never going to hurt you yep. um it can only help you the problem is you can't do that for every single question yep. if they said which of these did the author not mention as a cause for world war ii right like i mean that could be anything the author didn't mention a lot of stuff yep. <laughs> unicorns like you know my aunt's house in florida right <laughs> she didn't mention that like, is that it's the COVID. answer it's COVID. yeah right and so there's there's just like so many things that are not not mentioned. So like some questions that are very detail oriented like that, I think you have to look at the answer choices. But to be honest, I think that's actually a minority. Um, not so much this question as the previous one, where like, what's the relationship between video game and appreciative art kind? I would highly advocate a student not to look at the answer choices for that question. Go back mm -hmm. to the passage. What's the relationship? And then just match it. Like, oh, a video game is a type of appreciative art kind. And so like, that's a real easy thing to match if you've gone back. Versus so many other students are going to like get into the, the answers and they're going to battle them against each other and try to figure out. And so strangely enough, like going straight to the, the answers will actually make students take more time, um, which I, is probably the biggest argument that students have. Like, I don't want to go back to the passage and try to find the answer. Like, it takes too much time. I just want to look at the answer choices. I'm like, well... Strangely enough, if you go back, you'll answer it quicker mm. um, because you're not going to get tempted by those wrong answers because you already know what you're looking for and you're just trying to match that. And so like, this is, has nothing to do about that. This has nothing to do with that. And you can just like eliminate those really quickly rather than try to figure out like what's the essence of this answer and how does it relate to the author's viewpoint and the stuff in the passage. Like, nah, I don't have to worry about that. Good to know. Um, all right. Next question. Question 39, which of the following statements would the author most likely agree with? Oh, great. It's a Roman numeral question. Uh, Roman numeral one, all video games are works of art. Two, only some video games are works of art. Three, video games are a medium for creating art. Ooh, interesting. So I highlighted this. Video games are not are an artistically valuable medium. Games are artworks precisely due to their qualities. So this mediums for creating art is like, ooh, like... Mm, feels good, right? Feels like, good, but but the author never said anything about creating art. It just talked about the video games are the art. Um, so I think that's a feel-good one that I'm going to have to throw out. Um, I think so... I'm going to immediately throw out the, the C and D, which re represent answer choice three in them. So I'm left with A, one only, or B, two only. So 
hopefully I'm down the right path. So all video games are works of art, um, or only some video games are works of art. So the the author here is very straightforward that says video games are an artistically valuable medium, not some video games, right? It doesn't say right. video games that do X, Y, or Z. So I'm going to go with A, one only. Yeah. So all video games are works of art. You're in the, like that, that whole paragraph, like video games are an appreciative art kind, blah, yeah. blah, blah. The, the last sentence there, this feature that I call, which I name blah, 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 mm -hmm. um, will offer both philosophers and ludologists evidence to the claim that video games may be artworks and that the medium has something new and interesting to offer the world of art. So I think the author would consider video games to be a medium. Well, uh, no, I think it, 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 that's what I said. Video games are an artistically valuable medium. That's this first sentence here. Yeah. But the thing about three is it doesn't say anything about creating art. It's just video games are art. Ah, so that, that, that creating part is what is throwing me off. Right, right. But um, I think right? I would that's, argue that's, that, like, yeah. that's like saying a blank canvas is art. Is it? Yeah. Right. I, but I mean, the author does say over, over like repeatedly that it is a medium, right? Video games are a valuable medium. And then in the last sentence, like no, the video see, games and see, the I'm, medium. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge this question yeah. uh, because video games are the completed product. The code is the medium for creating art. Well, not according to the passage. Well, no, but that's not right. That's not right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're you're right. Like, I'll, I'll give you, like, outside stuff. But, like, the passage says a couple of times that video games are a medium. And so I, I would agree. Like, I don't think a video game or, like, a canvas is a piece of art. But if the passage said it was, then I would have to agree. Um, and so this might be one of those one of those things where, like, you got to be, like, super careful. Like, you actually do know something about video games. Um, and kind of like, you know, kind of trade, like making an analogy to like a, a canvas is something that a lot of a lot of people would do. But like just going straight to the passage, like it says it's a medium a couple of times and that there are. Yeah, and... but but that's a feel good thing. But <laughs> the video game isn't creating the video game is what has been created. Right. Yeah. And so I could see like like arguing the creating thing. I think there is something to that. I, there is um, something to that, and I am right, and that question <laughs> shall be thrown out, and let's okay. move on. All right, sounds so, good. So you're saying Blueprint says it's one and three only. Right. Okay, they're wrong. Uh, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> question 40. I'll, I'll let that slide since I'm leaving Blueprint. But, um, I'm not sure we're on the same page, but that's fine. Um, all right, your, is it my turn? Your turn. Okay. Which of the following is an example of representation by regulated interaction, according to the author's definition? In video games in general, A, an avatar might take a hit from an enemy, and it is represented to the player as a vibration in the video game controller. B, in Batman Arkham Asylum, the player avatar, Batman, is poisoned and begins hallucinating. While hallucinating about the murder of his parents, the Avatar turns into a young Bruce Wayne. In this state, the Avatar does not run, but only shuffles in response to movement commands from the player. C. In the game Grand Theft Auto, in order to find out how Liberty City is laid out, what kinds of people populate the city, and what the character's tasks are, and the options available to complete them, the player must direct the Avatar in such a way as to see, hear, converse, and otherwise gather the information about the world. D. In video games in general, facts about the character are represented to the player visually, such as the color of the character's skin or eyes, and audibly, such as the way they talk. So the the one part of this the passage that stood out to me while reading it is the part here, right? The for instance, the example, the relative right. mass of a character represented by the player by having the avatar move slowly or quickly in response to commands. That's directly related to B here. That if the if the the character the avatar is hallucinating they're going to change but also because they're hallucinating they can only shuffle in response to movement so i'm gonna go with b which is pretty straightforward i think yeah absolutely and i mean that's the whole argument from the passage is that it's not it's not what you're seeing it's the way you're controlling the character that's mm -hmm. important and that's what b is going into um a i mean that's kind of an interesting thing where like the the controller will shake when you get hit if you play video games 
Um, and that's that's a thing. And so that feels like sometimes students are like, yeah, but like that's not you controlling the character. That's, yeah. if anything, it's going in the opposite direction. Something happened in the video game affecting you. Yeah. Y- um, you could have you could have an art installation that smells and that's that's feedback to your senses as well. Right. Exactly. Or like, you know, or the way it looks or the way it sounds, which is what D is saying. But that's yeah. not how you're controlling the character and how the character responds. Yep. That regulated interaction. Yep. I love that you you jumped on this like so quickly. Um, this this question gets a lot of students. I think that students who play a lot of video games actually get like more caught up and like they start thinking about Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> Grand and Theft Auto. Batman, like, yeah, I remember yeah, that, was that a one good time. Game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Cool. Straightforward. 39 still wrong. Uh, <laughs> which claim about art is most strongly supported by the passage discussion about avatars not being limited to anthropor- anthropomorphic characters? Anthropomorphic characters. Um, oh, which claim about art is most strongly supported by the passage discussion about avatars not being limited to anthropomorphic characters all right uh a art is visual b art is exper- uh, experiential c art is practical or d art is theoretical which claim about art is most strongly supported by the passage discussion about avatars not being limited by anthropomorphic characters i have no idea what the heck this is asking <laughs> yeah um, so that's going to be in that last bit of the passage um, where they talked about being the breeze. Oh, the breeze. Or the and God's the breath. breath. Yeah. yeah. So. This this always happens when students get to like the last question of a set. They like, it's been so long since I read the passage. It's been, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. four or five minutes. Relationships, about the relationships that can be developed. Um, so art is visual doesn't necessarily fit that art is experiential potentially uh practical and theoretical um i don't know the experiential seems like it fits nicely but this it uh. yeah it's it's that sentence there that like in no other medium right would it be possible to enable the audience to feel some of what it's like to act on the world as a breeze or a deity yeah and that's why I want to go with experiential because you're experiencing that. Uh, but I don't know. Theoretical is is an easy one. It's like, oh, breath is theoretical or gods are theoretical or right? whatever. Uh, I'm going to choose B and move on. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Like you're the, the answer choice D there, which is probably the most commonly chosen wrong answer is uh, makes sense. Mm-hmm. Right. It feels good from the passage, but that's not what the passage was saying. Right. Like what's cool about being a breeze is it's the only way for you to know what it's like to be a breeze. And so it's about the experience rather than like a theoretical thing. Although there is obviously something going on with that. Yep. Wow. All oh, right. And I'm like tearing up. Another the, MCAT the podcast one. in the books. The last MCAT podcast for Phil Hawkins, thank you so much for your time as co-host on the MCAT podcast, sharing your wisdom, sharing your knowledge, sharing your wonderful personality with us. (laughs) (laughs) I'll take it. I'll take what I can get. Um, It's been a pleasure to all you guys listening. I just want to say I've enjoyed it. I enjoyed working with you guys um, and like just, you know, showing some clarity onto what's going on with the MCAT, which is a monster of a test. Just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Alrighty, another MCAT podcast in the books.